All reactionaries are paper tigers. Have you heard this before? A very famous quote from Mao Zedong. What does it mean? What is a paper tiger and what's a reactionary? Assalamu alaikum comrades. This is such a divisive term, one that gets thrown around all the time. Everyone I disagree with is a reactionary. You're a reactionary. I'm a reactionary. Dusya is a reactionary. You see, recently I was going through my little red book, Quotations from Chairman Mao. This is an original copy from 1966 printed by Foreign Language Press. Pretty cool. <laughs> Anyways, I of course always end up going to that paper tiger quote because of Anna Louise Strong, and I'll get to her more later. But rereading this, it really got me thinking into why it's a term so thrown around. And I wonder if most people using that term so loosely could themselves actually define what a reactionary is. So let's talk about it. Firstly, I must address that I know just in my last video I talked about unity. So know that this video isn't meant to divide us or me trying to set you up to look for who to attack next. I really just want us to think more about this term, this concept. I also just mentioned that theory isn't my strong suit, so I am expecting y'all to be extra harsh with me. Just let me humbly try and express why I even say that theory isn't my strong suit. And perhaps you aren't as versed in theory as you think you are. Now here's the controversial bit. The reason why I say I'm not strong with theory is because I believe that there's no correct way to interpret theory, which in itself is a weak stance, right? I don't like to say things with certainty when it comes to theoretics. Because of that, next to some dude saying, this is how you interpret Mao, this is exactly what he means by the paper tiger, I seem weak. <laughs> I just think anyone that says this is the correct and only interpretation is kind of silly. I think a lot of people use books and specific titles of books and slogans to appear bigger and brighter than they actually are, yet can't even use the concept of reactionary in a sentence. I don't know, unless the sentence is like, grew you is the har. You don't even understand what reactionary means. That's, that's a sentence you probably could use it in. But let's start with the full quote in the Little Red Book. Well, actually the partial quote that's in the Little Red Book. Firstly, workers in all countries unite. I'm sure there's some people out there who are book nerds like me and want to see what an original English printing of this looks like. In my 66 printing on page 72 is where you get to imperialism and all reactionaries are paper tigers, which starts with the partial quote from that interview with Anna Louise Strong, where it says, all reactionaries are paper tigers. In appearance, the reactionaries are terrifying, but in reality, they are not so powerful. From a long-term point of view, it is not the reactionaries, but the people who are really powerful. August 1946, talk with American correspondent Anna Louise Strong. <laughs> so how would we analyze that? Like I mentioned before, one of the first things I think we should do is try not to make it harder for ourselves than it needs to be. Avoiding the added pressure of feeling like we need to analyze it or consume it correctly. <laughs> Here I humbly stand before you in front of my collected works of Lenin, clearly just for show, in true historically accurate Soviet decor fashion. I joke, obviously, but yeah. Hello, welcome to Political Science 101, where I'm gonna teach you how to look at political theory. I don't have a pointer, so this is gonna have to do. Step one is reading the text, which we did together. In terms of analyzing it, part one is the contextual analysis, understanding the historical, cultural, and social context in which the theory was written. This helps clarify the intentions and circumstances of the theorist. Two is the textual analysis, analyzing the language and structure of the text to uncover meanings, arguments, and underlying assumptions. Three is philosophical reasoning, engaging with the logical consistency and ethical implications of the arguments presented. Next is the comparative analysis, Compare the theories with other political theories to identify similarities, differences, and potential influences. Five 
is an application to modern conditions. Evaluate how the theories, principles, and ideas can be applied to contemporary issues, considering current social, political, and economic conditions. And lastly, critical engagement. Critically assess the theories, relevance, strengths, and limitations in addressing today's challenges. This approach combines rigorous analysis with a practical understanding of current circumstances to find interpretations that are meaningful and applicable to today. But also, so different people can come up with different correct interpretations of the same political theory. This happens because 1. Diverse perspectives. People have different backgrounds and experiences influencing their interpretations. 2. Would be the complexity of the texts. Political theories tend to be nuanced in their arguments, therefore can be understood in a variety of ways. 3. Is the contextual differences. Interpretations may vary based on your social, political, and historical context in which the reader, you, engage with the text on your end. Like what about you is affecting how you're reading this. And then lastly, 4. When applying it to today, those different contemporary issues can lead to different interpretations and applications of the very same theory. So all of those factors allow for a variety of different interpretations, which ultimately enriches the discussion. Discussion and conversation around the same text can be so much more valuable and interesting when all of you have a different understanding and can productively discuss it without egotism getting in the way, right? But yeah, sure. Like this guy says, blah, 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 I bet you didn't even read Marx. Well, I bet you didn't read My Antifa Lover, A Riot of the Heart. Come back to me when you have, comrade. Please don't read that, it's awful. Okay, all of this kind of reminds me of my freshman year in college. There were a group of guys who were in all of my political science classes, and they would not believe me when I said that I had read Notes from Underground multiple times at that point. First time I read it, I was probably like 13. Anyways, they trapped me outside of the building, quizzing me for like 30 minutes to try and prove that I didn't actually read it, or if I read it, I didn't understand. That's what you guys are acting like. I love being a woman. And it's like, critique my religion all you want. I'm not the one being dogmatic about Marx. I'm sorry for dunking on your guys' comments, but if you're gonna publicly post something to me, say it with your whole chest and mean it, you know? Because I take it seriously. But again, I'm not the ultimate and all be all knower of all things, as I tried to demonstrate with that previous lesson. You don't have to take my definition as the definition, but rather a piece of multiple interpretations that you should be analyzing from a variety of angles to come up with your own conclusion. Now, on to Mao's paper tiger and the reactionary. So Mao's quote illustrates his perspective on the reactionary, those who resist progressive change and cling to the status quo. In Mao's view, these reactionaries appear powerful and intimidating, but in reality, they lack longevity and can be thwarted by the collective will of the people. I mentioned earlier how it's important to look at other definitions. I found an interesting definition on Marxist.org. It's always cool to see what sources they have and the way that they've chosen to define terms. And what they have written there is a political position that maintains a conservative response to change, including threats to social institutions and technological advances. Reaction is the reciprocal action to revolutionary movement. Reactionaries clamp down on the differences of the emerging productive forces in society and attempt to remove those differences, silence them, or segregate them in order to keep the stability of the established order. I don't like the example they use because they use the American Revolutionary War, which I feel could be just taken the wrong way, but it's interesting that's the example that they chose, so I don't take it with a grain of salt. Of course, another definition to throw in there. After looking through a variety of examples, I've chosen to express it this way, that a reactionary in political terms is someone who reveals a conservative stance in the face of change. They react against revolutionary movements and social advancements, striving to uphold existing social institutions, and fighting against changes that threaten their position. They clamp down on the emerging differences in society, seeking to eliminate or segregate these differences to preserve the established order. If you notice, I made it a bit more vague. Reactionaries can also exist from within your movement. I think it's important to mention how it's when their current position, whatever that is, is challenged. It's also interesting to note that many definitions point out the attempt to segregate or divide, causing havoc from within. 
And when I said reveals a conservative stance, it's because often the reactionary tries to appeal to you in your movement. So what does it look like when a reactionary exists from within? Interestingly, I think in these times, we often refer to other people within our movement as reactionaries more so than Mao's example of imperialists. So a reactionary can exist within the communist movement. They might be someone who resists changes within the movement itself, preferring more rigid interpretations of Marxism. That doesn't allow for current contextualization. They might hold conservative views on social issues regarding gender roles, cultural practices, or nationalist sentiments, which often conflict with the more progressive elements within the movement, and they might oppose new ideas in the movement's strategies. But no, not everyone you disagree with personally is a reactionary. There's way more to it. In his paper Tiger interview, Mao referred to reactionaries as the forces and leaders of imperialism, particularly American imperialism. He described those reactionaries as paper tigers, suggesting that while they may appear powerful or formidable, it's a temporary facade. Mao applied his metaphor to various historical figures, and this I find the most useful in understanding what he meant. The rest of his quote, beyond what we've already read and what is usually presented as complete, you can read it here. In the talk with American correspondent Anna Louise Strong, as I mentioned, Gotta love the local Seattle heroes. It's also important to note that this talk took place in 1946, a very specific time in the world. The majority of the conversation being on US imperialism and the progress made in the atom bomb and what that now means for the entire world, especially the enemies of the United States. So in context, the full quote, Anna Louise Strong says, but suppose the United States uses the atom bomb. Suppose the United States bombs the Soviet Union from its bases in Iceland, Okinawa, or China. And Mao then says, the atom bomb is a paper tiger, which the US reactionaries use to scare people. It looks terrible, but in fact it isn't. Of course, the atom bomb is a weapon of mass slaughter, but the outcome of a war is decided by the people, not by one or two new types of weapons. And then he continues to the part that we've already read. All reactionaries are paper tigers. In appearance, the reactionaries are terrifying, but in reality, they are not so powerful. From a long-term point of view, it is not the reactionaries, but the people who are really powerful. And then the rest of the quote goes on to give more examples. In Russia, before the February Revolution of 1917, which side was really strong? On the surface, the Tsar was strong, but he was swept away by a single gust of wind in the February Revolution. In the final analysis, the strength in Russia was on the side of the Soviet of workers, peasants, and soldiers. The Tsar, just a paper tiger. Wasn't Hitler once considered very strong? Just a year prior. But history proved that he was a paper tiger. So was Mussolini. So was Japanese imperialism. On the contrary, the strength of the Soviet Union and of the people in all countries who loved democracy and freedom proved much greater than had been foreseen. There's more to it. The very last bit is him talking about Chiang Kai-shek. Say Chiang Kai-shek and his supporters, the US reactionaries are all paper tigers too. Speaking of US imperialism, people seem to feel that it is terrifyingly strong. Chinese reactionaries are using the strength of the United States to frighten the Chinese people, but it will be proved that the US reactionaries, like all reactionaries in history, do not have much strength. In the United States, there are others who are really strong, the American people. Hmm. I just think that all of that in context is really important to consider. And then when you go on to another point I made earlier, the comparative aspect of analysis, Lenin did have a very similar theory, that of the Colossus with clay feet, a similar analysis that indicate while imperial powers seem imposing, they were fundamentally unstable and vulnerable to collapse. The move so you can see Lenin here. I'm going to read you what he said 
that I believe is comparable. Now this is uh, two years of Soviet rule speech at the joint session of the All Russia Central Executive Committee on the occasion of the second anniversary of the October Revolution, November 7th, 1919. And he said, Comrades, two years ago, when the imperialist war was still raging, it seemed to old supporters of the bourgeoisie in Russia, to the masses of the people, and I dare to say, to most of the workers in other countries that the uprising of the Russian proletariat and their conquest of political power was a bold but hopeless enterprise. At that time, world imperialism appeared such a tremendous and invincible force that it seemed stupid of the workers of a backward country to attempt to revolt against it. Now, however, as we glance back over the past two years, we see that even our opponents are increasingly admitting that we were right. We see that imperialism, which seems such an insufferable colossus, has proven before the whole world to be a colossus with feet of clay. And the two years through which we have passed and during which we have had to fight mark with ever-growing clarity the victory not only of the Russian, but also of the international proletariat. See the similarities? Both Mao and Lenin's perspective emphasize the ultimate power of the people over seemingly invincible reactionary forces. <laughs> But I really want to focus on Mao's words because what I find really cool about what Mao had to say is that an entire culture sort of spread around this paper tiger analogy. China managed to use this idea of the paper tiger to fuel a population to become something new, to give it inspiration, to cheer at other aspiring revolutionaries that they can do it too because their enemy, all of their enemies, be it American imperialism or individuals, are simply paper tigers that will crumble. I love the way it's been propagandized, and I mean that in a good way. And I think that's why we always end up going back to Mao on his words. He's someone who really shaped it and made it something his own. I have something in my collection I wanna show you in regards to that. It's just in this chest back here, so I have to dig through it. It's in one of these, but I'm not sure which one. I have a lot of ephemera hidden throughout my apartment that I just don't have room for to display. One of the things I recently got, it's not that, uh, is a poster from the Cultural Revolution that mentions the paper tiger. I just can't remember how big it is and therefore <laughs> which tube it's in. Nope. Haha! -ha, I found it. Sadly this arrived to me a little ripped so another reason why I haven't hung it up. Oh. Poor thing. Watch. Look how beautiful this is, though. And then, at the very bottom, I will translate it. Isn't it beautiful? Here's the rip you can see. But it says, you'll have to take my word for it, all reactionaries are paper tigers. I mean, it's, it's on everything. Recently I saw a post from Propagandopolis that was a, another version I'd never seen before. It's such an iconic quote, you'll see it in all sorts of places. Now I always found it interesting that it was indeed Anna Louise Strong who's responsible for the Paper Tiger interview, even known as the Paper Tiger Lady in China. Not because she's a paper tiger, but because she conducted the interview. And it's only fitting because here in Seattle, where Anna Louise herself was very much involved, we also encountered, I would say, this city's biggest reactionary, Ole Hansen. And I'm Ole Hansen's biggest hater. Anna Louise Strong is probably my favorite human being. May Allah bless her. Now, Seattle basically almost had its very own Bolshevik revolution. We came so close, and our reputation has always been a bit marred from it. In the 1930s, Postmaster General at the time even referred to Washington State as the Soviet of Washington. But I could get into Seattle's history and connection to the Soviet Union and communism another time. But here, former Seattle mayor Ole Hansen, which I will always pronounce Ole Hansen, Scandinavian, and I mean that in a derogatory way, he too, was a reactionary. He campaigned on workers' rights, working with the labor movement, being friendly with the labor movement and the radicals in the city, but then quickly revealed his true intentions. Note that I mentioned that revelation being a part of being a reactionary. <laughs> Once the labor movement gained popular support and its power reached its peak in the great 
general strike in 1919 once Ole no longer benefited from those workers and instead was challenged by them, he did everything in his power to set the city's workers' movement back, the negative effects we still feel today. He brought in the National Guard for an unarmed general strike. He's also the reason why our once extensive streetcar system was dismantled. I'll never forgive you, Ole Hansen. In stopping this mass workers' movement, he chose to preserve institutional structures that benefited him. He came out in the opposition of change, and he revealed his true conservative approach and stance. In fact, he would go on to tour around the United States, speaking out against Bolshevism, being heralded as a true American who stopped the potential turn of communism in the United States. He wrote this god-awful book called Americanism versus Bolshevism, and by the way, he made more money touring uh, talking about the evils of Bolshevism than he ever did as mayor of Seattle. One of my favorite parts of his book is for three pages, he goes on this like rampage comparing Americanism and Bolshevism, but it's like the most unhinged thing ever. And it doesn't even make sense. Americanism stands for law. Bolshevism disdains law. Americanism means love of your fellow man. Bolshevism teaches and practices hatred and envy. Americanism means increased production and increased prosperity for all. Bolshevism stands for destruction, restriction of output, and compulsory poverty. It's, it's like, it literally reads like an insane person on Twitter. Under our government, we have prospered, grown, become, and remained free. Under Bolshevism, wherever tried, people have starved, suffered, and become and remain slaves. Americanism is great enough to be just and just enough to be great. Bolshevism is always unjust, and in its injustice, only is great. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Our countryside rings with happy song and laughter. Russia, the Bolshevist's paradise, knows neither happiness nor song. Clearly, he's never heard a single Russian folk song or any of the banger labor songs that were inspired by the Bolsheviks. Um, don't read this. But in opposition to that... <laughs> after the supposed failure of the strike, Anna Louise Strong, the head of the strike committee, because yes, she was behind the general strike of 1919 where the workers almost took power permanently in Seattle and started our own revolution. She wrote the post-strike pamphlet uh, called the Seattle General Strike, an account of what happened in Seattle and especially in the Seattle labor movement during the general strike February 6th to 11th, 1919, issued by the History Committee of the General Strike Committee which is just Annalise. Now, something that I think is important to look at and remember uh, is how we can be inspired by it. It wasn't just simply a failure. Olda Hansen would go on to conduct interviews when the strike was still going, saying he had squashed Bolshevism in Seattle. Something that ultimately diminished the morale amongst the strikers, because like the rest of the country thought it was already over, based on those false reports. And it, yeah, that's a whole other thing. But she has this section called "Won or Lost." From coast to coast, the newspapers declared the general strike in Seattle was lost. The Seattle newspapers announced the same fact, declared that the workers were creeping back to work downcast, that they had lost their strike. The press then proceeded to offer them many bits of advice and admonition, chiefly that they must clean house at once and get rid of their radical leaders. But strange to say, except for an occasional note of regret, the workers of Seattle did not go back to work with a feeling that they had been beaten. They went smiling like men who had gained something worth gaining, like men who had done a big job and done it well. The men went back feeling that they had won the strike. Hardly a word of regret was heard from the men who had lost five days' pay for a cause. It was the men whose business had been hurt, the men who had expected riot and found none, who told them they had failed. So it is worth considering for a moment to what extent the Seattle general strike was won or lost. And that is a great point, Anna. <laughs> because it's one big lesson learned. The incident serves as a reminder of how reactionary forces can emerge from within the very institutions and individuals who initially seem supportive of the workers' cause, and that the working class is to remain vigilant and discerning about their leader's true intention. The general strike, despite being met with fierce opposition, demonstrated the remarkable potential and unity of the working class. Even with temporary setbacks, while challenging, these instances can also serve as rallying points to strengthen the resolve of the masses, be that bring inspiration or to engage in a more proactive and direct efforts against the reactionary. 
Another quotation of Mao that doesn't get as much attention about reactionaries says this, It is up to us to organize the people. As for the reactionaries in China, it is up to us to organize the people to overthrow them. Everything reactionary is the same. If you do not hit it, it will not fall. This is also like sweeping the floor. As a rule, where the broom does not reach, the dust will not vanish of itself. This is from the situation and our policy after the victory in the war of resistance against Japan, August 13th, 1945. So he actually said this before his interview with Anna Louise. Now it's a bit more confrontational. This one does insinuate that you might want to go after the reactionary, but again it's important to know what a reactionary actually is. Who's actually a reactionary? So I'm not saying, uh, in the words of Mao, go sweep up that dust, but in the words of Mao. <laughs> I hope what I'm saying shows more just the historic value of the term, the importance of the concept rather than abusing it. Do you feel like you can apply this theory to current events? If so, who would you apply it to? What would you apply it to? I think it's really important, first and foremost, for us to actually read the theory, then engage with it. But I also understand not all of us have the time and bandwidth to sit and consume something that is relatively complex, let alone ruminate on it enough to apply it to modern day conditions. I understand why some people don't read. Just stop projecting that onto me. This concept really is a cornerstone of revolutionary theory, highlighting the enduring power of the masses. The collective strength and solidarity of the workers are the true engines of social change, capable of overcoming reactionary forces and achieving more for our societies. Oh, all right, comrades, I can't wait to see the comments. Again, it's totally fine if you disagree with me here, or if I did a piss poor job. We're bound to disagree on some things, on the different conclusions. But I hope my little contribution can further your understanding of the term, the history of the term, help you apply it to other things, and ultimately help you build an understanding that is your own. Again, down below, let me know if you have a better definition or what your personal definition is, and where exactly we might differ. If you'd like to support my work, links are down below. I have a Patreon, that's the best way to do it. And I also have a PayPal, which you can send a one-time donation to. If you want, compensate my labor. You'll get cuter outfits in the future. All right, I'll stop before I say too much. Be inspired by history, comrades. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>